So welcome back, everyone. We will have our second international guest speaker, Mahendra Mahay. Uh, Mahendra manages the Andrew W. M. Mellon funded British Library, British Library Labs project, which is also on Twitter. I follow you on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> and um, its aim is to encourage and support anyone interested in using the British Library's digital collections and data for their research. So please, Mahendra, welcome. Okay. Um, so, hello, hello everyone. Um, um, is that okay? The back? Okay, good. Um, so, my name is Mahendra, and the title of my talk is Inspiration and Lessons from the British Library Labs project, which is a project I manage. Um, links to my slides, that's a link to my slide, but on all the other slides, it's at the bottom of the page. I've also included hashtags if you, if you want to tweet. Um, for those of you that were here earlier on during the break, there was a little video which was um, of um, some illustrations from a book I found uh, in the hotel last night. <laughs> and uh, it was from Gothenburg to Deca Decacalia. I don't know if, that's, if I pronounced that right. But um, if you want to download it, there's a link to it there. So, um, an overview of my talk. Um, what I want to do is I want to sort of um, give an overview of the work that we've been doing with these different kinds of groups of people, um, working and communicating with them. So researchers, artists, librarians, curators, software developers, <coughs> archivists, and educators. And hopefully, um, I'm going to give you some ins inspirational examples of the work that they've done. But at at points during my presentation, I'll also talk about our experiences and some of the challenges that we faced and some of the lessons that we learned. So uh, this is the British Library. So for those of you that don't know, this is, this is the British Library. Um, the building at the top is the main building. It was, de uh, developed, it was built in 1997 by a naval architect. I don't know if you can tell. Um, <laughs> um, also, this is a teaser for later. This spot here is the poet circle. This will come up later in my presentation, so watch out for it. Okay? Um, we have uh, four floors underneath this building with books. Um, we also have our books and uh, newspapers in Boston Spa, which is about 150 miles away. That's one of the wor uh, warehouses. It has low oxygen so that bugs can die and um, robots. A lot of our books are based there, so they take about 72 hours to get to London. It's a reference library, so you're not allowed to take any books out. Um, it's legal deposits, so we get everything uh, in the UK and Ireland that is published, so they have to give us a copy. The space inside uh, seats about 1,200 people. Uh, we get about half a million visitors per year. We're also responsible for the public lending right, which is based at Stockton on Tees. And that's the author's right to payment every time a book is taken out of a public library. So they manage that process. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I really encourage you to read this. This is the, the vision for the library for the next <coughs> eight, <coughs> eight years <coughs> um, by our CEO, Roly Keating. And in that document, he actually references our project quite a lot. So we've had a lot of support from Roly. But these are the kinds of things we, we work with, the custodianship, research, business, culture, learning. We have a big international focus on partnerships as well. So, British Library. Um, we have a lot of stuff. Okay? Um, we don't actually know how much stuff we have. Uh, um, this is, these are all guesses. Okay? Uh, but in terms of physical items, it's estimated about 180 million items. And it's not just books either. We have patents, stamps, maps, sound recordings, musical scores, manuscripts, um, serials, it, that's 800,000 serial titles, though, so those are magazines, so you have all the weekly editions, and we even uh, stock shop catalogues, um, randomly. Um, so, on to my project, uh, British Library Labs. So there's one thing I want you to remember, this project is all about getting people to use our digital collections, and experiment with our digital collections. Um, we're funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we've been running for about three years, we're based in the digital scholarship department in the library, which is very much focused on people using our digital collection. So this is all about digital. Uh, in terms of how much stuff we have digitized in terms of this 180 million, 
Um, it's probably about 1% to 2%. Again, we don't really know, um, but it's a kind of a guess. Um, previously, we used to use government funding to fund digitization, and that changed uh, because that funding was withdrawn. Um, so a lot of our um, digitization takes place through par partnerships through commercial organizations or um, benevolent organizations, charities. Uh, obviously, the amount that we have is increasing all the time. And there's one little point I just wanted to make was that there's actually a little bit of a bias in some of our collections. <clears throat> So if you're a researcher wanting to do some research based on some of our digital collections, they may not be representative of the physical holdings. And that's just a little important point I want to, I'll probably bring up a bit later as well. So basically, where we, where we are in London, we're actually surrounded by digital all around us. Okay? So <clears throat> this is the knowledge quarter, which is within a one mile radius. Um, I speak in miles, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, that's 55 knowledge organizations. Google's just about to move in. So we're all connected. We, we meet regularly. We do lots of partnerships and collaborations. Um, we're also the headquarters for the Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science. Uh, we also, the library hosts the UK Web Archive. Um, and we also have illegal deposits. So we actually also take electronic resources legally as well. We have billions of things through, through, the, through that particular piece of work. So basically, digital's all around us, so we're surrounded by it. Um, in terms of finding open digital collections, uh, that was my, uh, when I first came to the library, that was one of my challenges. How do I do that? Uh, again, we didn't really know how many digital collections we have, and there's probably lots lurking around in drawers and on DVDs and hard drives, which we probably still don't know about. But I think to date we have over sort of 630 collections. Like one collection, for example, is the UK web, which is billions of objects. Okay, that's just one collection. Uh, so it's a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, but it's also like going through a cave. And sometimes you see a really interesting light and you go into that and sometimes it's a bit scary because you think, oh my god, what's there? Um, but it's a, it's a bit like that. Um, so this, the, these are my tips for finding open digital collections in your organization. Uh, first of all, s stupid question, but where is it? Okay. Is it accessible? Has it been cleared for copyright? Okay. We are very lucky in the library. We have an internal committee called Access and Reuse, and they determine the licensing for digital collections. And in that group, we have all the different um, people that have interest in digital collections, so strategic, commercial, we sell some of our images, and digital content, copyright, curatorial, technical. Also, this is what's a big lesson I learned at the beginning. Is it curated? Always find the story behind the collection. Is there a human being in your organization who can tell you about this collection? Um, and importantly, do they want you to open it up? because that can sometimes be a challenge if they don't. And are there any surprises lurking? So remember the cave, the light, and you go in there, oh my god, that's a bit scary. It's always important to know the, the story behind the collection. And also, is there any metadata, catalog records available? And what state is it? Does it need cleaning? So challenges of digital access at the library. So this is the British Library. Some of our digital content is not online. It's available on storage devices. Some of those storage devices are not store, um, supported anymore, like uh, CDs. Well, CDs are, I think, still out. Tapes. Uh, some of it is personal data, so we get personal digital archives from very famous people. They give us their computers for keeping. Some of our digital content is only available in the reading rooms on a PC. That's the only access you get. Uh, some of it is only on site for copyright reasons or ethical reasons. Some of it is behind a paywall. You've got to pay for it. This is the, this is the happy place where the Rijksmuseum lives, and we sometimes live in that place, um, uh, which is online and open. Sorry. Um, but these are challenges, and I'm going to come back later to this slide to show you how we dealt with this challenge. So how do you find the digital collections that we have? Um, well, we have... Uh, some collection guides. Um, we have 62 open 
digital collections that are, um, that are listed on our, on our website. Um, but that's if you want to find out more information about our collections. We're soon going to have data.bl.uk, where we will have um, lots of, we, ha we do have some APIs, but some more APIs for access to some of our data. So I'm going to quickly show you some of our digital collections. So um, we have digitized playbills, books, newspapers, which includes OCR, optical character recognition. We have uh, images. So that's the Qatar Digital Library. We have a partnership with the Qatar Foundation um, in the Middle East. Uh, the International Dunhuang Project, which has been working for 20 years to digitize things from the Silk Road. Hebrew manuscripts. We have a 400,000 images from Hebrew manuscripts. We also put things on Flickr and Wikimedia Commons. Um, we have lots of maps. Uh, we also have the British National Bibliography, which is about 4 million catalog records available openly. Uh, usage data, so the data in terms of borrowing, we have that information. And in certain circumstances, we can allow researchers or scholars to use that. We also have been recording TV and radio for the last 10 years. We also have um, music, um, sheet music, and sounds. So we're not just about books. Uh, so we've got all this digital stuff. Um, this is our target audience. This, this are the digital scholar. We're a re research library, what, probably one of the largest research libraries in the world. And we're looking for people who want to use our digital collections. That's who we're looking for. And this was very much the philosophical origins of the project. This was our target audience. So I'm going to show you this little video now. And this kind of shows the sort of philosophical basis for our project and the kinds of things we wanted people to do with our content. So can you describe your thesis in two minutes? Most people think historians spend all their time in the library reading books. And you wouldn't be far off. But recently, the library has gotten too big, way too big, and it's getting bigger at an alarming rate. That's because billions of records have been digitized and are now online. Historians are faced with far more material than they could ever hope to read in a lifetime, or even a hundred lifetimes. My research looks at a pretty typical historical question. How were Irish immigrants to London, England treated at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution? But instead of heading to the library, I'm heading to my computer to apply some of the best tricks of computer science to the task, namely distant reading. Distant reading basically means figuring out what something says without actually reading it. It's the type of classifying that Google does to help you find a recipe for an apple pie. Google hasn't read those web pages. Instead, they've created a computer program that does it for them. I'm doing the same thing, but instead of focusing on pies, I'm asking questions like, which documents refer to Irish people? Like Google, I've developed a set of computerized tests to determine if a document is relevant or if it's not. That automation is crucial when you're dealing with databases containing hundreds of millions of words of text. But finding relevant material isn't all we can do in the age of the internet. Computers have also allowed me to measure aspects of 19th century life in which the Irish experience differed from that of a typical Londoner. For example, I can tell you that an Irish person was roughly four times more likely than an English counterpart to appear in a London court on trial for his or her life. There's no way we would ever have found that out without distant reading. We live in a world in which information is overabundant, and managing it effectively can mean the difference between finding what you're after and getting lost in a jungle of data. There's too much to read out there, so it's time we found another way to do it. My name okay. um, you'll see Adam a little bit later. So this was the research space we entered this project. So we were looking for people who wanted to use computational techniques to do things with our data. So these are the kinds of things we were looking for. So location-based searching and geotagging visualizing our data, using APIs, uh, corpus analysis, text mining, natural language processing, crowdsourcing and human computation, annotating text, manuscripts, and also transcribing them. So that was where we started. And that was our primary audience. But as the, as the, the journey that we took, it started to involve all these other people too. And that was not something we planned. It just kind of happened. So this is the space that we occupy. So we have your audience who have a research interest. And it may be an interest in uh, something that's digital, maybe not. 
we have the digital collections that we have or what you have, and that's where Labs works, in that intersection between those two things. And this is very much our philosophy. It all starts with a conversation. And we, uh, we need to remind people that only a small amount of content is actually digitized, even though it's a large, you know, it's actually quite a lot of content. And we can't promise people that they will be the treasure they expect at the end of their journey. But let's go on the journey and let's see where, where, we, where we end up. So how do we do it? So how do we get people to work with us? So we run a competition where we ask people to tell us their ideas of what they want to do with our digital content. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We have awards where we say, show us what you've already done with our content and projects, collaborative projects. We just, we just talk to people, and then we work on various different kinds of projects. So our competition. So this is actually my last roadshow. I've been on 18 visits around the UK. So Sweden's my last one. Okay. The, d the deadline for the competition is Monday, so you've still got time to enter. Okay. Um, the two finalists will be announced in late May, and then we work in residency with them between June and October. Uh, residency is a really important word. They get some money, they get lots of support, and we, we get them to show their research or their shiny thing in November. And they get some money. Also, I brought um, a bag with me, British Library bag. Okay? Um, if you pitch an idea to me and I like it, you'll get this. Okay? <laughs> um, so our awards. So these are projects already using our collections. <coughs> And the reason why we did this is we want to know who's actually using our collection. So there's lots of people using it, and we don't know what they're doing with it. So that's why we've done this. They have to submit their ideas, oh, their projects by the 5th of September, and there are four categories, artistic, commercial, research, and learning and teaching. Again, they show the winners are announced on the 7th of November. They don't get so much money, not as much as the Rijksmuseum, but you know, they get some money. But they get fame and glory. Um, what we found is that we really want people to talk to us because their preconceptions change once they try to get access to the data. Sometimes they can't even get access to the data they want. And once they see the data, they, their ideas change quite radically. So that's why we need to have a conversation. And we just want, we want to start a conversation. That's a very important word for labs. So I'm going to give you some examples now of things that people have done. And I'll start with our competition. So this is a typical problem that we have. We have lots of stuff, and it's a mess. Okay? And how do you find that kind of information in, in that content? So for example, our, our text that's been scanned in from books is messy. It's got lots of errors in it. And this is a kind of a typical pattern that we've been following in labs. We clean up the data, a little, a little sample of it. We get what we call ground truth data. So we say that's good data. And then we work on writing code to find things in that data reliably. And then we try to write using the same code to find it in the messy content. And then we tweak it. And that's kind of a typical research pattern we've been following. So there's two examples now I'm going to show you that where we've done that. So this is Katrina Navikas from last year. Her idea was called a political meetings mapper. And she was interested in the Chartist movement, which was a movement for democracy for working people, working men, actually, in the Victorian times. And that's a, that's a meeting that took place. It was a very popular movement. And she was particularly interested in the Chartist newspaper, which we have digitized. And what she was particularly interested in was finding where they met and plotting them on a map. So a political meetings mapper, simple idea. And there's some links to, the, to some interviews and presentations she gave. And what she found was really interesting was she found there were actually lots of meetings that were held in London, which she didn't know about. And she found an, a number of meetings which she would never have been able to find manually. So it was really important for her that she found these things and the, for her research. So she was very excited about this in her project, because that's a heat map of where a lot of the meetings took place in London, because most of her research was based in the north of England. So at, in labs, what we decided to do was we decided to hold a walking tour of all the places, well, some of the places around London. It was a very wet day. Um, 
And we wanted to bring that history to life. It's like a forgotten history, and we wanted to bring it to life. So we, we of course, ended up in a pub. And those of you that know me, that's kind of a good place where, I, where to go. Um, and this is a little peek into a step back in time. I think I've learned a lot from this experience, going to the actual sites, showing, seeing how long it takes to get from one to the other on foot. And I think we've got a flavour of early Victorian London. I second the resolution. I am happy to say that the cause of English radicals has met with the sympathy of the Irish Chartists. Hooray! So please, um, show of hands for the resolution. Carried unanimously. <laughs> This is the next researcher, Bob Nicholson, from 2014. He had a similar issue. He wanted to find Victorian jokes in our archive and make them funny again, and that's really hard. <laughs> okay. Um, so we worked with him. He built something called a Mechanical Comedian, which posts a bad Victorian joke every day. Um, and this is probably the best one. So. Ethel, I'm ashamed of you. I saw that French man in the conservatory kissing you repeatedly. Why didn't you tell him to stop? I couldn't, Jack. You couldn't? Why not? I can't speak French. <laughs> okay. So uh, part of this uh, project was all about public engagement, and Bob's been on radio, and he's been telling jokes to the public, and actually some of them are quite funny. There's also an artist that he worked with called Rob Walker, who took the mother-in-law jokes and made a little video. Okay, it's a bit Monty Python-ish. Some of you won't remember Monty Python, but it was great. So here's a little clip from. The, there's, a, there's a health warning. They're quite, you know, they're quite not politically correct. So. You insult me in my own home. Now, Edwin, that's quite impossible. How's that? You live in a rented house. <laughs> Abigail, before I depart, I must give you this bit of advice. Yes, Mama? Never love a man for money. It's wrong. But never love a man without money. That's just stupid. <laughs> Good day. So, okay, on to the awards. Um, this was a project by Dina Malkova. She found a digitized um, manuscript, a very famous manuscript. She loved the design. This is the manuscript, Alice in Wonderland. We have the original, hand, hand illustrated. And she made bow ties. And she sells them online and in our shop. And she makes cufflinks as well. So it can be very simple, the ideas. Uh, this is another idea. This is a poster of a bookshelf, which is about that high. Um, it has QR codes on some of the spines, and you can download the book. Very simple idea. Uh, this is a research project. This was looking at mentions of disease in Victorian newspapers and plotting them on a map. Oops. Uh, this is uh, our wildlife sounds. This was a competition we held. Uh, where we went to documentary filmmakers to make a film with our wildlife sounds. So the next film is about Dave. Dave is a dreamer. He works in a shop, in a clothes shop, but he really wants to be a naturalist. And this is his study of the London hipster. Dave. In these remote parts of southern England exists a creature easily recognizable by the loud rumbling that precedes it. The young middle-class urban dweller with non-mainstream but fashionable sensibilities, also known as the London hipster. Like many of its aviary cousins, the male of this species is often very colorful, covering himself from head to toe in vivid accessories as a mating call to nearby females. Dave! Dave! Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a bit of audience participation, okay? So this is a competition that we help hold every year for computer games designers, and we give them asset packs based on our exhibitions. So we had Prefire London, Gothic, and Alice Ad Alice's Adventures, okay? And they produce interactive experiences. They're fantastic, but I can't show them all. I don't have time, but we're going to take a quick vote, okay? Uh, who wants number one? Hands up. Okay, num number two. 
Okay, number three. Oh, number three it is. Okay, right. So let's just. It's 30 seconds of this. So. Ah. Oops, a minute. Stop using the internet. <laughs> uh, that's not going to work. Wait a minute. Um, sorry, you're going to have to see it later. Okay, sorry about that. I lied. <laughs> um, so I haven't got time, sorry. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, our current competition is off the map Shakespeare. Shakespeare's anniversary of his death. Um, competition closes on the 6th of June. I uh, urge you to have a look. It's really fantastic, some of the previous entries. So I'm now going to sort of finish with the story of just one collection and what amazing things happened through one collection. This is a collection of 65,000 books that were digitized by Microsoft in 2000, 2007 and 2008. They wanted to get into digitization because Google were getting into digitization. Um, they, at the end of the project, they actually decided they didn't want to get into digitization and they gave us the stuff and we made it public domain. So they're mostly from the 19th century, and very few of them have actually been read, so they've kind of been languishing in the library. So what we did was we ran an experiment. We, we call it eating our own dog food. We're asking other people to experiment, so we thought we should do some experimentation. So we decided we would snip out all the images from those books, computationally. And we ran some um, uh, software on there, face recognition, and what we found was that the software is based on passport photos. These are illustrations, but it was pretty good at recognizing female faces, not so good at male faces. But through that, we created something called a mechanical curator, which published an image, a cutout image, every 30 minutes. It's still going now. But through this process, we decided that we needed to put the images that we found somewhere. We went to our ID department, and we kind of quickly realized it would take many years for them to actually make a decision. So um, we, we decided we would, we would put it online because it was public domain. We found that many images, a million, and they're available, freely available. Anybody can use them. The CC0, public domain. We've had over 400 million views since we launched on <laughs> Friday the 13th of December 2013. But the other reason that we did this was we wanted those images to get tagged because the, the image was taken out of books. We knew about the book, but we didn't know about the image. So we wanted people to tag those images. So about half a million tags have been added. There's been amazing press about it and some really creative uses. That's a skateboard you can buy for $63 that uses a wave image. That's some, a playing card game, which is a Kickstarter project, which is just about to be released. Um, but what we did do was each image has links back to our own systems. That was really important to buy, get buy-in from the library. So th those are automatically generated tags, and these are user-generated tags. Um, in 2014, we worked with commer a commercial um, quango in, the, in, in, the, in, in Britain called the Technology Strategy Board, and we worked with a startup company, and a guy called Peter Bauman won it. And basically, the challenge was, what is the value of making things available on the, in the public domain? That was the challenge. And what Peter did, he developed an analytics dashboard for the library to show what's happened to our uh, Flickr images. And there's a link to, the, to his slides there and a presentation he gave. Also, just to sort of mention briefly about tagging, um, these are our top taggers. So James Heald, Mario Klingerman, and Chico45. Okay. Mar they're all human beings, but Mario and James um, use computational methods. Chico, is, he wants to remain anonymous, but I can tell you he's 75 years old. He's from Los Angeles. He's bedridden, so he's, his health's not great. He's tagged a staggering 40,000 images. And I just wanted to make a point about crowdsourcing. And um, the, the mention about niche sourcing, um, the reality with crowdsourcing is that 
a lot of people do very little. A very small group do a lot. And that's been our experience. And we've called this iterative crowdsourcing. When we put the images up, we didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't know what was going to happen. But what's happened is clusters have formed and things have started to get tagged. So a company that we worked with in America developed some mobile games called Metadata Games for our ships, portraits, and book covers. Cardiff University worked on a tagging engine for these images. And we've been working with the University of Oxford to use machine learning and Google's image search to actually f see if it can find images that haven't been described in our collection. This is Mario Klingerman. And he's, he won our Artistic Award last year. And he, found, he uses machine learning to find images and create art. So these are 44 men who look 44. Did that for his birthday when he was 44. Um, the, face, the, the, the faces look left to right, actually. These, these are tragic-looking women he found computationally in our, in our archive. This was brilliant. A hat on the ground spells trouble. He's also made art, and there's some fantastic talks he's given as well. Uh, this is James Heald, who works as a volunteer for Wikimedia. He created an index of all those images. OK, thank you. And for the reason to actually to find all the maps. So he found 54,000 maps with volunteers, which are being geotagged at the moment. Uh, Adam Crimble wanted to see if we could use an arcade machine, which we built. Um, to help us crowdsource images. Uh, two games were developed, game, um, Tag Attack and Art Treachery. Art Treachery is a game where you have to steal a painting of art from a gallery, so you have to steal the painting of the dog. So you go around with a torch, you're being chased by robot guards, and you, you, you get the image and you get some money. Tag Attack is a little fox goes across, and you have to use your joystick to say which of the four things it is. We haven't got time to show the video, but it's, it's really, really cool. I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to try to finish now with um, a little story. And if there's time, I, I'm overrunning a little bit. But this is the story of an artist who found our images about a week after we released the millionth one on a very traditional method that the library uses of Facebook. OK, I'm being slightly sarcastic. Um, and he found all these images. and. This is his story. Where did we put it? Do you remember the very first slide of the British Library? OK. Very great and important Then we had a party. OK. Celebrate the opening. <laughs> 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 And they brought images of art into the poet circle. About 600 people, of crazy people turned up. It's really great. Um, it was about a celebration of our digital collection. So we invited lots of artists, musicians, lots of drummers. And it was a fantastic evening. But the point was, open the doors and amazing things can happen. So this is a, a creative writer in residence who performs music. That's Mario's work, he did an art installation. DJ Yoda, that's the music you can hear. 
he I, uses I, our sound. I, I know just about enough. That's Zamora the Torture King. I'm not going to say any more about him. <laughs> I, 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 I use my wireless set a good deal. I'm David. We use Blipper for image recognition. You take, so you could use your mobile phone to go back to the image on Flickr and then go back to the original book. So physical, digital, physical, digital. What are they going to flip? So this is um, uh, so a work that we got not that long ago, and we, we kind of fell off our feet when we saw this. Right, OK. I've got two minutes to talk about challenges, so I'm going to... Um, whiz through these very quickly. So what we found is that having a conversation with people is actually quite difficult, because we come from a particular culture, the library comes from its culture, and people come from their culture, and there's lots of misunderstandings. And these are some of the things that are misunderstood. Access is always misunderstood. Oh, yes, we can give you access on that PC in, in that reading room. Oh, no, we wanted all of the things. Um, well, I'm sorry, you can't. Um, but that's one of the things we've learned. Also, we found that our data isn't very clean. Um, there are lots of square brackets in some of our catalog records. We, we did a bit of visualization to see how many square brackets there are. Square brackets means information is guessed. So the next slide, color in blue, is square brackets. OK. Uh, we have problems with OCR. It's difficult. Uh, also, we would love to have a simple URL to everything, but we don't really have that yet. So we've just been working on APIs, but we've been literally posting hard drives to people. Just get the data out there. It doesn't matter if it's messy. Just get it out there. Uh, also, we found that some people have technical problems, technical skills. They lack technical skills to, to work on their projects. Should, should we focus more on training them, or should we work with people who have those skills to work with them? And I think the answer is probably both. Uh, and why we're doing this is we're trying to learn how the library should be supporting doing experiments better, but we're, we're still making lots of mistakes, but we're, still, we're trying to do it. Uh, that, remember that slide earlier on? We developed a residency model where people work on site and other libraries have started to do it. So I urge you to do, do that. Bring researchers into your institutions. Uh, lessons we've learned is there's a huge appetite for digital content, as you can see from Flickr. Uh, we're learning that there are gaps between what researchers want and what they want to do with our data. And we're helping them navigate their way through the library and all the tacit knowledge in people's heads to sort of get them to do things that they want to do. And people have described labs as a bit like a human API. Okay? Uh, so f finishing off, open your doors. Okay? Let the researchers in to use your collections, start those conversations, start small and simple, but think big. So I just, just staying from the right. Uh, embrace serendipity, work fast, and give energy to things, OK? Learn the lessons, tell the positive stories, and move on. Don't be afraid to experiment and fail. Uh, if we focus too much on perfection, we'll never get anything done. That's what we've learned, OK? Fear of failure is seen as a negative thing. I'm just going to finish with Jimmy Wales, who will hopefully describe our philosophy. Well, one of the most important uh, piece of advice that I've ever gotten is a common saying in Silicon Valley called, fail faster. The first uh, version of uh, the Wikipedia project was actually called Newpedia. Uh, very top-down, very structured. It was a failure, but I beat my head against the wall for two years, and I knew for about at least a year of that that it was, the system was too complicated. We needed to simplify, but I didn't want to fail, so I didn't fail fast enough. Don't invest your whole uh, career and life and, and all your money in one thing uh, so that you don't have a chance to reboot. Uh, lots of small experiments, so fail faster. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mahendra. Wow, you had material for two days there. Yeah, I know. Very, very inspiring. Let's all go and download your presentation. I just want to say thank you to Maria Press for inviting me. That was completely serendipitous. We met in Manchester and she said, why don't you come to Gigi Cult? And so I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I've, we're, we're heading for lunch, but I still, is there any pressing questions in the audience? I think we should have one or maybe two, if there are any. Or are you just blown away? I did that just in case oh. to help people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Any questions for Mahendra? <laughs> yes, please. So the question was, how many are you working with this initiative, the labs initiative? Two and a half people. Wow. That's inspiring. <laughs> the advantage of that is you can be very agile and work quickly. So time is a factor. So we use time as a factor to focus decisions. And sometimes you make mistakes when you do that, but that's how we describe it. And you can also sneak through the cracks if you're small as well. Yeah, I guess I just, my, I mean, my main reaction to this was, wow, there's so much stuff that comes out that also brings people together in real life. Like, it's, it's such a, it does, what well, I'm from the museum world, but it does give that sort of space for encounters in a real life setting as well, because of all the ins inspiring stuff that comes out of it, which is, uh, I think you've done a great job there. I, I think the really important thing is to have stories to tell, especially to people who make decisions. So people who are a little bit sceptical, who have doubts, curators, senior management, if you have stories, people understand stories. So if you, uh, you let people in, you know, just start small, one person, and you know, who knows where, where it will go. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna take lunch. Uh, följ Stefan har nog ja, Stefan står där bak. Följ honom om ni är osäkra på var vi ska ta vägen och vi syns igen kvart över ett.